All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar and also like to thank you for taking the time to, to join us uh, over, over this quick lunch, lunch uh, uh, webinar on introducing the Green Economy North and the Micro Network to mining SMEs. Uh, before we jump into our call, I want to just acknowledge that we are on uh, uh, the Ur Ur Robinson Uran Treaty territory and that the land that we're all gathered is a traditional uh, territory of the Atikmashank Anishinaabeg. So to kick things off, I would like to um, ask our President CEO of SEMI, Douglas Morrison, uh, to say a few words about SEMI, and, uh, and then he'll also give us a bit of a highlight on MICA, and then I'll expand a bit on that. Uh, following uh, uh, Douglas's words and my introduction to MICA, uh, we will introduce our team from Breathing Green. Douglas, please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much, Charles. We'll move on to that slide. So, just a little bit of background on the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation. We were established way back in 2007 as a not-for-profit by the two local mining companies in Sudbury, Ontario. At that time, they were Inco Limited and Extrata. And we developed a vision that said basically to help mine solve the challenges and make the future happen as soon as possible tomorrow. And we also wanted to accelerate the commercialization of innovation into the mining industry. So, the mission was essentially to advance uh, innovations that will help mines to find more ore, mine more safely and effectively, generate more value from mines, and have a more benign impact on the environment, and a more beneficial impact on communities. Next, Charles. And the first major program, the innovation program that we ran, was the Ultra Deep Mining Network, which was focused on deep mines more than 2.5 kilometers below surface, and it ran from 2014 to 2019 the Ultra Deep Mining Network. And so that was our first experience of a network. And from that, we learned a few things. Next, Charles. Next, there we go. Yes, so we realized that the crucial difference between research and innovation is that research develops new knowledge and innovation develops new businesses. Uh, as SEMI, we were always focused on large changes, two to threefold improvement in performance or a decrease or, of half to two thirds of the cost. And we use the TRL technology readiness levels to explain where we sit in the whole mix. There are many organizations do, that, that do very excellent research and we are happy to leave them to do that and to support them to do that. But we fulfill the role of taking research results on through demonstration, implementation and to commercialization. So you can see the box that SEMI sits in and we focus our attention on SME-based innovations and commercializations, primarily through the mine service and supply companies. And as we started working with those companies, we realized that in actual fact, many of those small companies need some help with commercialization. And so we started to introduce uh, Charles's division, which looks after the uh, commercialization services. Charles, next, next. So commercialization services, basically to identify the gaps uh, in the skill sets that small companies need and then help them to find different uh, services that will help them bridge those gaps and then allow them to go into innovation scouting, challenge identification and matching the industry challenges with the solutions that the SMEs develop. Next, so if we go back to where SEMI fits in this innovation niche, uh, our newest program is now called MICA. Next, Charles. Uh, that's where it fits. So we've actually moved further towards implementation and commercialization. We will still do some demonstration projects, but MICA is largely focused on the implementation and commercialization end of the spectrum. And also we've included the cross-sector companies. There's a great deal of innovation going on in other sectors of the economies with uh, small to medium-sized enterprises. And we want to link up those SMEs with our mining service and supply SMEs to accelerate the whole process of innovation for MICA, uh, for the mining industry. And our four target areas are for mines to increase their productivity, decrease their energy use, reduce the risk and long-term liability of tailings waste, waste management facilities, and, by, and we'll use autonomous technologies, smart digital technology, to make all of those three other things happen faster and sooner. And with that, I will hand you back to Charles. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Douglas. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, uh, kind of a, a 
quick overview of the layout of the mining innovation and commercialization accelerator network. So the network has six main partners across the country. Okay, and uh, those main partners uh, go all the way from uh, British Columbia with BRIM, uh, the British Research Institute for Minerals and Mining in British Columbia, Enotech Alberta, in Alberta, of course, Saskatchewan Polytechnic in Saskatchewan, SEMI here in kind of north, Northern Ontario and Ontario, and Mars really looking at that Southern Ontario and uh, the GTA, and also covering Ontario. And we have a group MISA, group MISA, which is located in Quebec. And we also have the College of the North Atlantic in Newfoundland. So you can see that the MICA network is actually across the entire spectrum of, uh, of Canada and covers all the different regions of Canada where the different kinds of mining are also happening in our country. The mining partners that do border with the territories also have a responsibility to address the uh, mining in those areas as well and to understand the innovation ecosystems in those areas. Uh, Saskatchewan will take a look at also what's happening in Manitoba and uh, we've got Newfoundland, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick also covering the, the rest of the East Coast. I want to quickly jump into you know what are the benefits of mica to the mining companies and the benef the main benefits of mining of mica to the mining companies themselves uh, is that uh, mica is going to allow these mining companies to find a place where they can get early adoption of technologies they can also offer their sites as demonstration sites and uh, mica will have a plethora of innovative solutions that are coming out of the entire Canadian innovation ecosystem and so mining companies can actually use this platform to seek solutions and importantly is also the leverage funding that is also accessible through through the MICA program. And there's going to be a series of network activities happening across the whole country where mining companies can participate to get known and to get acknowledged for the great work that they're doing across the whole country and to be known by the innovation ecosystem uh, as pertaining to their challenges as well. The next big group of MICA participants is obviously the SME groups and the entire support system, ecosystem for innovation. And what are the benefits to these innovation organizations that support mining? Uh, the, they can access leverage funding. They can also access market opportunities within MICA. Uh, there will be complementary technologies available through the other members of MICA, and that's another area as well. Capacity building is another area of interest that people are going to be able to participate in that area as well. And then there's commercialization capabilities that are within the MICA membership that can also be accessible by people that are part of the MICA network. And then there's cross-sector cross, cross collaborations, uh, opportunities to cooperate and to use the collective of, of MICA to be able to move things forward. And the other piece also is investment, because we do know that to move technology forward, we do need investment. So MICA offers that as well. To participate in MICA, we do have a membership model for MICA, where you can actually apply to become a member. And the way that the process works right now is you request a membership uh, to become a member uh, through our website, and we will then assess eligibility, we'll conduct some interviews, and then after the interviews, there's an approval process, a subscription process, and then there's going to be an onboarding process where we onboard you to become a member. And again, I just want to emphasize that you can become a member by actually going to the website and, uh, and clicking on the various links there. There's a lot of information on the website about how to become a member and how it's split out in different categories, so you can take a look at that as well. Okay, so now jumping into the conversation at hand. So the first thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, the world is moving towards net zero and there is a requirement for everyone out there to sort of understand what their own individual carbon footprints are and how that contributes to the whole. So when it comes to SMEs, there's an organization called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which has sort of put out these 15 categories of areas of interest that should be looked at when you're looking to calculate what emissions are uh, are being uh, emitted by the scope three, which is mostly sort of the, the supply set, set, the downstream supply set sector. And how does that sort of interact with the mining companies? So the reason why we, we, we spoke to the folks over at Rethink Green, and I'm gonna be introducing them shortly, Alex and Simon, is that they have a methodology and a process in place that can actually help SMEs to truly understand what their carbon footprint is and what areas they can improve to become more compliant. So on that note, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome to the floor, Simon Blakely, uh, who is a Green Economy Knots Program Director, and Alexandra Miller, who is Green Economy Knots Sustainability Officer. Uh, both Alex and, and Simon are experts in their field. They're very passionate about the environment and passionate about the future that we are all creating mutually. And so I'm going to hand it over now to Alex and Simon. Quiet, please. Okay. 
Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, so just uh, while Alex brings the slides up, perfect. Um, so I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, that I'm joining everybody today from the beautiful city of North Bay, uh, which is situated on lands forming the traditional territory of the Nipsing First Nation Anishinaabe peoples. I'd also like to say thank you to Charles and Douglas and everybody else joining on the call today uh, and for joining us. So as mentioned, my name is Simon Blakely and I am the program director for Rethink Green, where I facilitate the green economy law and smart green communities programs. Our sustainability officer, Alex Miller, is also presenting here today. Some of you may be familiar, but others may be asking who or what is Rethink Green? We have a not-for-profit environmental programs incubator based in Northern Ontario. We offer a variety of programs programs and services designed to connect people, ideas and resources in ways that help create and build more sustainable communities. As an organisation, our goal by 2030 is to build an engaged network of champions across 500 communities and organisations in Northern Ontario. We recognise the opportunities that exist in Northern Ontario to demonstrate leadership on climate change, ways that uphold Indigenous rights and traditional knowledge, and support the integration of and inclusion of all people in the emerging low carbon economy. As you may have heard in the news, COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, was recently held in Glasgow. And this was widely understood to be a momentous make or break meeting. Pledges, targets, goals, investments made in Glasgow could ultimately decide our own fate as a human species. We now have just 28 years left to decarbonize our world and achieve the overarching target of net zero emissions by 2030. And achieving this target may not involve the complete removal of hydrocarbons from our existing systems of production, but it will require a combination of enhanced energy efficiencies, such as energy retrofits and new builds, shaped by strengthened legislation, regulations, and funding based support substitute fuel and energy sources, including the accelerated uptake of renewable and smart technologies, integrated waste diversion and management systems, such as preparing, restoring, recycling and reusing the many products and materials we already have in circulation, and nature-based solutions, guided by the practices of circularity, regenerative design and biomimicry. These would play uh, replicate nature's own system. So what does this mean for the mining industry? Mining can and should play a crucial role in our transition to a low carbon economy. Our net zero future requires mined minerals and metals. So a global revolution in clean technology can be fully utilized. Broadly speaking, mining companies should be expected to meet those needs in the most socially, economically, and environmentally responsible way. And this includes introducing corporate commitments, governance processes, the board management and facility levels are all stages of the boundary chain and supporting action on climate change that fosters with a sense of environmental stewardship. Protocols that fall under this umbrella include tailings management, biodiversity conservation, water stewardship, and as we will discuss today, energy management practices to control greenhouse gas emissions. So let's kick off based explaining what we mean when we talk about scopes in the mining sector. The greenhouse gas protocol breaks different emissions down into three different scopes. Scope one includes direct emissions arising from the mining company's own operations. These are the emissions associated with what's burned on site using owned and controlled resources. Scope two includes indirect emissions from the generation of electricity steam, heating, and cooling systems, which, is, which accompany purchases, such as power provided from a remote electricity generating station. Scope free emissions include all of the indirect emissions along the value chain. This can include end users, but also refers to the emissions associated with the operations and logistics of small to medium sized businesses. These produce the very products and services that the larger mining companies rely on. So I can't honestly say I'm an expert on mining operations. 
So if you have any specific mining questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Douglas or Charles. What I do know is mines need buckets and emissions associated with the fabrication and distribution of buckets to the mines and all the other indirect business activities that come with the fabricator do fall under scope free emissions of a larger mine company. Most of you will know that acetylene is currently an essential fuel gas used in the steel fabrication process. So let's consider how a bucket fabricator can evaluate its acetylene use through various scopes identified. In this case, scope one emissions refer to the emissions associated with burning acetylene on site in the steel cutting and welding process. Scope two would include emissions associated with manufacturing of acetylene. Scope three includes emissions associated associated with the transportation and distribution of acetylene from the point of production and use. We go on and break these uh, kinds of emissions down further, um, or even the emissions of the acetylene manufacturer itself. But at least you can see how this one source of greenhouse gases applies within the context of different emission scopes. Some of you may be mining supply companies for Valet, one of the largest and most well-known mining companies in the world, with operations here in Northern Ontario. Valet also happens to be a founding member of our Green Economy Model Program. This graphic from Valet's climate change report illustrates that Valet has adopted some short, medium, and longer-term goals, which apply to both scopes one and two, being scopes that are directly within their control. This includes a commitment to use renewable technologies to meet 100% of its global energy demands by 2030. And more recently, Valet Global presented its target to reduce its net scope free emissions from its clients and the supply chain by 15% by 2035. Funcor, another member of our Green Economy North program, set itself emissions reduction targets by the baseline year of 2019. This includes a short-term target of reducing emissions by 15% in scopes one and two by 2026. A medium-term target of reducing its total emissions by 50%, including scopes one, two, and three by 2035. And the end goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2030. Most targets established up until now have covered scopes one and two almost exclusively. Exclusively, meaning emissions into scope three are left out as a bit of a blind spot. But what we're seeing now is the larger mining companies are starting to go beyond scope one and two and increasingly setting targets for scope three. With the global community now seeking to accelerate the pace of action on climate change, introducing more robust energy efficiency management plans which enable decarbonisation and reduce emissions is set to gain place in the coming months and years. Simply put, organizations such as Ballet and Glencore have the buying power to make these energy efficiency gains, placing a greater emphasis on sustainable procurement. Or in other words, large mining companies can, and what are more likely will, increasingly prioritize mining supply companies who demonstrate they are low carbon are actively taking steps to become low carbon. But have no doubt, this will affect the entire mining sector and SMEs wanting to stay involved in the mining sector should prepare for this shift. The race to succeed in the next economy is now begun. And given today's strong turnout, it seems most people already know it. Setting targets for scope free emissions can be challenging for mining companies because they're often seen as somebody else's emissions. Methods to set those targets include input, output modeling, life cycle and assessments, and gathering information from suppliers and end users. Even though suppliers come forward saying they want to partner, figure out ways to reduce their emissions, those efforts are often stifled by the absence of a single accepted method of measurement and a lack of information from businesses within the supply chain. Sunil Kumar, energy strategy 
Strategy Director at Ken Ross Gold, brought this issue up recently at the Energy and Mines Virtual World Congress. He said, one of the challenges we find, especially with some chemicals and material inputs, is when we reach out to suppliers and ask for their emission intensity factors, a lot of them until recently just didn't have that information for themselves. And this leaves the mining industry at a bit of an impasse. Large mining companies are ready to do the work, but the small to medium-sized enterprises involved in the supply chain often don't have the means, records, or resources for that work to take place. And as you can see in this chart, scope-free emissions from mining companies account for the vast majority of total emissions in the mining sector. And this is why larger mining companies will increasingly place emphasis on these in the years. So a bit of an open question here. If a mining company asked you for a statement of your emissions, how would your SME be able to respond? And what if the mining company said it couldn't issue the purchase order before it received details of the carbon management plan? I'll let you ponder on those, but in the meantime, I'll hand over to Alex to explain further how our Green Economy North program can help. Thanks, Simon. Um, so with that, uh, Green Economy North was established in 2016. It remains Northern Ontario's only membership-based sustainable business program. And we equip businesses, non-for-profits and the broader public sector with the knowledge, information and tools they need to pivot and succeed in the green economy. In the context of measuring scope three emissions within the mining industry, Green Economy North offers affordable and tailored support to help these businesses set and meet their emission reduction targets. So they can not only develop solutions to address scope one and two emissions, but also positively participate in these broader scope three emission reporting efforts. As a program, uh, we deliver technical advisory and research-based programming. We organize and deliver business and community oriented events. We encourage knowledge sharing and collaboration among our virtual networks, and we recognize and celebrate that progress made by our members. In regard to tackling scope three emissions, a key component of the program is that we offer technical support to our members, helping them estimate their existing annual greenhouse gas emissions across different energy sources and scopes. Once the impact of a business or organization has been quantified, as a carbon dioxide equivalent measurement, we delve deeper and assist our members in producing action plans and setting targets to both quantify and reduce their emissions and achieve real cost savings. Uh, working with our partners, uh, including program members, different levels of government, academia, utility companies, community groups, and other stakeholders, we are leading this conversation and hopefully supporting the shift towards a more sustainable way of mining in Northern Ontario. Green Economy North forms a hub within the wider Green Economy Canada network, which serves communities and regions across Canada. The network's reach currently extends from Edmonton to New Brunswick and from London to Ottawa. And in this wider network, hubs share best practices, uh, best practice case studies, and other information to support our members as they make progress with their sustainability goals. And Green Economy Canada leverages uh, many funding opportunities of value to the network as a whole. They have also facilitated expert working groups such as the Net Zero Manufacturing Project and the Sustainable IT Procurement Project through which SMEs have received up to $20,000 worth of free carbon mitigation training and advice to help them address industry specific issues and challenges. To date, the Green Economy Canada Network has engaged over 300 businesses set more than 70 targets and secured commitments to reduce more than 200,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, together we're demonstrating that this sustainable economy is indeed possible. Uh, so how do we do this here in Northern Ontario? Well, as a designed hub, Green Economy North is responsible for guiding Northern Ontario uh, based members through our milestone process. Uh, starting in January, 2022, we are introducing a cohort-based model where businesses and organizations can benefit from a series of collaborative opportunities to learn from each other, as well as collectively set and achieve greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Uh, so this process, uh, I'll walk you through it. 
there's uh, the first milestone is get engaged. At this stage, members are oriented at a kickoff meeting and they get to know the network. We talk data, emission sources, and we take those necessary first steps. By keeping our fingers on the pulse, we are equipped to share up-to-date knowledge, information, and resources with our members. This stage is, is really all about empowering and enabling these stakeholders to understand their own footprint, because as of right now, those small to medium-sized supplier companies are considerably underserviced. And we bring in guest speakers, share industry-specific examples, and attend conferences, workshops, and seminars, and summarize that information and share that with our, with our members. Milestone two is the measure your footprint. So we conduct a baseline energy walkthrough and produce greenhouse gas emission inventory reports using our impact tracking tool. Uh, members would share their utility bills and this information is then referenced to understand where there is additional room for improvement and, and recommendations are then communicated with our members. Milestone three is uh, set a target. So members are offered support mobilizing their green teams, outlining their greenhouse gas emission reduction goals and pathways, creating achievable action plan and setting ambitious GHG reduction targets. And the best one, this is my favorite milestone is achieve results, the most important part. So we recognize our members success through media releases, social media shout outs and case studies. Uh, plus we celebrate individual achievements at our annual sustainability awards, which is going to be coming up soon. I'd also like to take this opportunity to briefly mention our Smart Green Communities program, which is, it follows essentially the same milestone process outlined with Green Economy North and is designed to build capacity and promote collaborations for long-term energy planning among municipalities, townships, and First Nations communities here. Some of you may be asking like what kind of actions might businesses, organizations, and communities look to pursue at this time here in Northern Ontario? Um, well, with the price of natural gas and other fossil fuels now increasing exponentially throughout the world and the relative cost of renewables decreasing, there is now an urgent need to reduce our total energy demands through greater efficiencies, adopt alternative technologies by electrifying our existing lighting, heating, and cooling systems, uh, evaluate the effectiveness of existing commercial equipment, appliances, and fleet, and introduce adaptive low impact development solutions to restore our balance with nature. At the property scale, the cost and payback on solar and battery-based technologies is now again becoming highly attractive to investors. Uh, local solar installers here in Northern Ontario are reporting record levels of interest in sales. Uh, energy audits, which we uh, do here with Green Economy North, will generally be required in support of a grant funding application. And that's, that's really where we can assist. Um, on the community scale, uh, the installation of microgrids powered by renewable energy sources could significantly reduce the amount of energy lost through transmission between communities. The development of net zero buildings will add an extra layer of resilience for communities impacted by climate change. Uh, given our experience and the more recent insights that we have gained from our uh, low carbon retrofit project, uh, Recent Green is equipped to provide project, base, uh, project management led services on a fee per service basis to assist with broader strategic and transformational products. Um, from an electric vehicle perspective, the Government of Canada has announced fuel powered cars and light trucks will be banned from sale as of 2035. And here in Northern Ontario, and especially relevant to our mining conversation, researchers continue to identify new sources of rare earth metals, such as lithium, which can be used to develop battery based technologies and other components for use in electric vehicles. There have also been several announcements lately regarding new funding streams to help communities and businesses mitigate and, up to, and adapt to our changing climate. And this includes the renewal and upgrade of community assets. Mining companies have an opportunity to demonstrate leadership by supporting this work. As national and global carbon pricing systems continue to evolve over the next few years, some companies might also consider the use of carbon offsets to reduce their to total impact. And in addition, 
We at Rethink Green currently await the outcome of a major funding application, which if successful, could enable us to introduce a microgrant program to support action among our membership. Green Economy Canada too uh, is about to sign off on a multi-year electric vehicle charger grant subsidy program. And we will be providing further details on this initiative in the new year. Uh, but looking beyond grants, you know, we know from experience that uh, our members can make considerable savings by implementing projects that reduce their utility costs and associated emissions. Uh, we're looking to kick off the new year afresh with the deadline for receipt of information on how to become a member and join our next cohort currently set at uh, Friday, December 31st, 2021. Uh, that one's an easy date to remember, New Year's Eve. Uh, potential members are invited to complete a membership inquiry form, which we can circulate via email uh, together with other information and instructions following this webinar. Uh, individual membership fees are calculated on a, an equitable basis in reference to a chart produced by Rethink Green, which accounts for both uh, total floor space area in square footage of assets owned and or leased by the uh, by the organization and the total number of employees based on the full-time equivalent number of positions. By pricing our membership this way, we ensure they fairly reflect the energy intensity and the use of different businesses and their operations. Uh, please speak with us if I'm clear on how to calculate these numbers. We're happy to help. Uh, spaces will be allocated on a first come first serve basis and sponsorship and guest speaking opportunities are always are also available. So, you know, feel free to contact either Simon or I uh, in case you have any questions or if you'd like to engage with us further. Um, this concludes our presentation, but I understand that Charles might direct some questions. Uh, but thank you very much for having us. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you, Simon, for the presentation. I think definitely, you know, your presentation has helped close that knowledge gap, you know, between, you know, what the SMEs uh, contributions are going to be required of them as they uh, service the mining companies. There's a question that came into the chat here, and uh, I'm going to just, just read it out. And the question was about, you know, can we cite some real green projects that the mining companies have been engaged in, you know, towards things like reducing emissions and advancing the green agenda. And I think the most obvious one for people that live in the Northern Ontario area, especially those who live in Sudbury, I think you all know that Valley has this huge super stack that is become sort of a landmark. And, you know, what Valley has been doing over the last couple of years is uh, integrating new technologies that are actually going to reduce the emissions coming out of the super stack by about 40% in the sense of emission reductions. And then also the SO, SO2 emissions are also being reduced by about 60%. So this is a good example, you know, of, of a company that is actively doing something to reduce those emissions. And I think, you know, maybe also on the green, on the greener side, you know, Sudbury is known uh, for having what's been called the Sudbury miracle, where the landscape of our community has been transformed, right? And, and the, the, the good thing about it is that the way that we've transformed the, the, the Sudbury environment uh, is that we have planted more trees, right? Which means that we've actually offset as well by planting those trees, because you know that trees do have some offsets that can be calculated uh, around them. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for more questions. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question or type it into the chat box and I will be reading the chat box and answering questions. Simon and Alexandra and Douglas, feel free please to pipe in with some answers as well. Uh, but I'm going to just go and read the chat box while someone else maybe answers or elaborates on some other things that I've, I've said. Yeah, just while you're looking for some further questions there, Charles, I'll see that Rebecca um, has posted. She's uh, Rebecca Daynard is our executive director of Rethink Green, and she's on the um, call today. She was the, the founder who brought Green Economy off to, to Northern Ontario in 2016 and helped really broker these partnerships with Green Economy Canada and has been really immersed in this work for such a long time. Um, I joined the organization in April 2020. Obviously, the COVID pandemic has uh, kind of distorted progress in some areas, but what we're seeing now, and it's evident in the attendance today, is this real uh, uptake in interest in the program, uh, in moving forward, in coming together to develop these solutions. And um, part of our work going forward will be to be able to uncover this and, and draw out these case studies um, and make sure that everybody's aware of it, what's possible, 
um, so we can all grow together and go forward. Gotcha. Yeah, Simon, I do have a question for you. Uh, and the question mm -hmm. is, you know, for a company that's not producing a product, but that's of, of providing a service to a mining company, how do you sort of address that company's uh, scope three emissions? Can you com maybe comment on that? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, challenges around that right now, particularly when it comes to like a uh, hybrid or home-based working. Um, but what we have, so essentially, by Green Economy Canada, is a standardized tool that all, the, all of the different hubs use across the networks. It's called the Impact Tracking Tool. Um, and it's in accordance with the Greenhouse uh, Gas Protocol that we mentioned. Um, so, Really, it's a blown up Excel spreadsheet. We're much more complicated than that, but uh, it requires participation on behalf of members to enter into their, their data. So in this case, fleet management for coming to the scope of emissions. Um, and so really tracking and uh, monitoring uh, how to travel or what emissions are burnt in that process and, and identifying those pathways to reduce them, which can include, as we know, teleworking, which has been more efficient in terms of how you plan and organize meetings, uh, carpooling, and some of these are the, the basic concepts, but they really need to be embedded within the culture of an organization, and people can realize significant savings. Uh, you know, gas prices uh, are going up significantly right now, um, and they're only going to increase, uh, and, and you're going to see, you know, that, that shift. We are at this pivotal moment right now. Electric vehicles are happening. So that's just one way that, uh, in terms of like travel, uh, emissions associated with that. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, there's another question in the chat box. I'm going to read it out. Uh, so Simon and uh, maybe Douglas and, and Alex, uh, if you can pay attention to it, you may be able to answer. Uh, the question is, can you speak more to the types, conditions at a systems level needed as emissions reporting expectations climb for small suppliers? And then the, the, the second part of the question is, how can we ensure green priorities don't leave small suppliers behind? Um, you could say that some of the smaller suppliers are actually, uh, particularly the new SMEs that are developing in a, in a better position because they're less fixed by the existing ways of doing stuff and they have the opportunity and they're more nimble and, and able to, uh, to accelerate this change faster. So I'm not sure that the smaller you are will impact your ability to, to engage and participate. For the shifting towards like medium-sized businesses, I'll be honest and say sometimes it requires a culture shift within the organization and it comes back to leadership within that and it's all to do with shareholders stakeholders uh, executive directors within companies really taking this seriously and not just looking at it from an environmental nimby perspective but really understanding the connection between how that impacts our overall health as a planet how um, you know it can reduce your costs especially as a business and and by reducing your costs, you become more competitive and it helps you stay in the market that you want to be in. So um, I'm not sure it's even a choice anymore about uh, businesses will shift um, this way. So what we're here to do is uh, provide you with that foundation, that baseline, that knowledge of understanding to help take these steps. That can include the soft measures such as green team development to more technical aspects of understanding uh, how your building operates, how what efficiency gains can be made doing that. So uh, that's what the milestones are about. And uh, we'll take on members through that starting in 2022. Gotcha. Yeah, in fact, there's maybe a comment on that as well. You know, one of the reasons why we have the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator Network is to identify, you know, late stage developed technologies that are clean tech in orientation that can actually help supply uh, mining, mining operators, not only, you know, uh, increase their, their productivity, but also help them to, to reduce their, their footprint and, and also so that they can, you know, help accelerate these this, uh, small companies into, uh, into the global global uh, market with their technologies because mining is a global industry so you know if more made in kind of solutions can be developed that can have you know a, a positive impact on, on 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 footprint for carbon footprint then i think we'll see a lot more uh resilience uh of, from the canadian supply service sector absolutely and i did just see in the chat there that Lala, Layla, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name, sorry, um, has uh, referred to one particular stream here about nature-based solutions and how that could be an opportunity to tap into. So just to add that um, members of ours receive a monthly newsletter 
but it's not just like kind of like, hey, here's an event to go to. He'll go to the, those events himself. He'll read those polls documents. We'll read the grants. We'll break it down for you. So we're kind of really eating into that work to save you the time and effort. And that knowledge base that we create gets shared with all our members. So um, there is a lot of, um, as was promised by the, the Liberal federal government that's been re-elected, a lot of money coming down the line. A lot of this is like a Biden's updated uh, climate uh, plan for Canada of uh, December 2020. Um, so now we'll be monitoring that to see as and when these different streams can fall. Um, and I think it's crucial to mention that because people say, oh, it's all good, Simon and Alex, you're, you're identifying all the stuff that we now need to do, you know, that causes extra stress. Well, no, there's, there are grants available and we can either break that down for you so you understand what it is and whether it applies to your business and your action plan, or go further than that on a fee-for-service basis and write the application for them. So um, we've been doing this a long time. We know what, what works, um, and it'd be honored to work with you to, to make that shift. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. I have another question here, and it's to do with offsets. What are some of the things SMEs can do to to accumulate carbon offsets? Yeah, um, this is a rapidly evolving field. Um, there's different criteria about offsetting in terms of like which projects are eligible and, and the organizations which are responsible for certifying what is an eligible project. And you'll see more of this coming down the line. Um, so I won't comment on the specifics. I wouldn't say that's another benefit perhaps uh, of being a member of ours or just generally keeping connected in the industry and understanding that these changes are coming and that offsetting, particularly for businesses where it's just not feasible, not every property, particularly an old box can be brought down to net zero. Uh, we know that. Maybe you can make some step changes and get to 60, 70, 80% reduction in emissions. And then you get to a point where it might make sense to use offsetting as a tool to, to get you to net zero to cross the line. So. Um, that is certainly part of the uh, equation and we'll be uh, bringing information forward on that. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I've spoken to Alex and Simon about is uh, the fact that, you know, so we think we're in, you know, sort of in the Northern Ontario space, right? But what do you say to an SME, say, who is in Newfoundland or an SME who is in, in the Yukon? You know, where can they go for services? And I think you may have mentioned it in, in your slides, but I want to just maybe bring it up again in case someone, you know, is listening from another part of the country. Yeah, um, now specifically Newfoundland, I'm not sure that we have an existing hub there right now, uh, but uh, that could well change. So Green Economy Canada, as I say, is, uh, as Alex mentioned, is the umbrella organization, and we do cover large swathes of uh, Canada. So we, we have currently an outpost in Edmonton, uh, the New Brunswick uh, Provincial Hub is due to launch uh, on the 20th of January. Um, the, the making inroads into other provinces, Quebec being one, but uh, in Ontario, we are the Northern Ontario uh, base. So Green Economy North cover your needs here, but I would say as Green Economy Canada continues to expand and grow as a network, uh, these programs and services will be available to different communities. Okay, thank you for that. All right, looks like we have reached uh, the end of our, our presentation time. It is 4.45. Uh, I just wanted to again thank Simon and uh, Alexandra and Douglas for, for the presentations. And also want to thank everyone else who came online. We will be making a copies of this presentation available to you or via email to all, everybody that registered. And also a link to the video will also be, be provided to you. So without any further words, uh, thank you. We're going to sign off and have a nice afternoon. And if we don't see you, happy holidays. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.